Hey, and we're live. live. Look at that. Here we are. It's Tuesday at TNT. I'm here with Brendan and Tim. We're talking due diligence. We're talking data rooms. We're talking preparing for investment. Uh, I guess want to say hello, Brendan and Tim. Hello. hello. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is now part four in our six part series. The goal of this series is really to help the entrepreneurs that are participating in the investment summit feel as prepared as possible for those conversations that they'll be having with the investors. Just to remind everybody, pitch night is coming up on Thursday. We're going to have 40 pitches, 20 from Edmonton, 20 from Calgary, all happening simultaneously. We've got 55 investors confirmed to participate now. Uh, don't you worry. We're going to get that number up to 60 over the next couple of weeks. This is going to be a really exciting time. We've got some really cool companies. And our friends here, Tim and Brendan, work at a company called that they've launched called Fourth Street Capital and Consulting. They spend a lot of time helping companies prepare for investment, a lot of time in the M&A space, um, and they even do some work on due diligence themselves. Um, they help us organize the investment summits, and they've participated in the investment summits. So great to have them here, massive knowledge base, and we have been using their virtual data room as a guide for these discussions. So guys, where did we kick it off last time? Or where did we end it last time? Where should we kick it off today? I think, I think the last time, Zach, we were talking about product. We were talking product. Very, very important. Um, yeah. Who's going to share the screen? You guys want me to share or are you going to share? Uh, you can go ahead. All right. So Startup VDR template. So this was created by our friends here at Startup TNT. Everyone who's participating in the summit, you should have access to this in your resource folder. This will be the same list that our investors will be using. And uh, yeah, it's nice and well organized. We talked a little bit about product development at the end of the last meeting. Let's talk about sales and customers. Let's talk a little about intellectual property and let's make sure we talk a little bit about the deal diligence as well, because uh, that's going to be an important. One. So sales and customers, guys, what do you, tell us a little bit of how, how you expect to see the sales and customers folder organized and what kind of key information you expect to see in there? I'll let Tim take this one. This is his, this is like his wheelhouse, his specialty is customer economics. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a portion of it that's customer economics and there's a portion of it that's customer traction. Um, you know, we, we could walk through each each one of these things, but um, a, a pile of them are pretty self-explanatory. I think that I think that the to those two points, one around customer economics, that's sort of this pricing strategy and, and how this is all going to shake out. Um, you know, understanding, call it customer acquisition costs, lifetime value, you know, how you're going to price and why. Um you know, who your, who your competitors are, you know, a list of that and, and understanding how they price and how you kind of slot in like a power, a power uh, grid or power chart, like you would have in a, in a good slide deck. Um, all those types of things are, are pretty important. And then the other half of it is, you know, LOIs or actual revenue with customers. And if you're a B2C, then this would be, you know, the number of customers and how long they've been around and some cohort analysis. If you're B2B, then it would be you know, similar concept, but more around LOIs and, and, you know, how big this is going to be going and, and, uh, and all that type of stuff. Yeah. And if you, if you're not generating revenue, then, uh, you know, maybe if you're doing some field testing or some trials, this would be a good spot to, to demonstrate uh, some of that. And so you can use customer testimonials or some trial data that you're collecting um, and really demonstrate uh, how your product is performing in the market. So here, let's let's dive a little deeper into the first one on there because I actually think pricing strategy can be a very daunting thing to figure out in the early days. Um, any thoughts on like what you've seen or how you expect to see like a good pricing strategy document or a discussion around that? I, um, yeah, I mean, you could you could simply just put in what your product pricing uh, looks like. So if you have you know three different tiers, talk a little bit about why. Or, or what those tiers look like. Um, you know, if you're, if your business is super like, uh, like it's low gross margin, um, but like high acquisition cost, you know, maybe, maybe that business model doesn't make sense. And when you're looking at this from a pricing perspective, you know, if you have a product that's like really feature heavy and, and lots of, uh, um, you know, you've, you put a whole bunch of like product dev work into it, but you're the lowest cost in the market, you know, maybe that pricing strategy doesn't really jive with, with 
what you're building. And so I think it's just explaining that in a, in a coherent way. And some of this stuff will be in your pitch deck and some of it you can add more color to behind the scenes, which is, you know, adding it to the due diligence room. Um, but I think, yeah, just, just talking about that in, in particular would be, would be helpful to demonstrate to investors. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I don't think it has to be an overly complicated document. <laughs> what an investor wants to know is that you have some level of coherent thought behind why you're pricing something the way that you are. Um, if it's like, well, it's, we want it to be cheaper than everything else so that we can get customers, like, frankly, that's not going to fly. Like <laughs> the, if there's, if there's like probably the most common advice that people in sales and marketing give to startups is like, you're pricing too low, price higher, like get it going. Um, so having, having coherent thought around, you know, the competitors and how you're slotting in compared to them and how you're pricing as a result, I think is super important. Yeah. And then, you know, I think you guys hit on something here that's really important is that the pricing strategy, is it consistent with the overall business strategy and where does it compare to the rest of the competitors? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. And, and like, how are you adding value, right? Like to the above concept of product and how you're tying in with your customer, like does how you price reflect how your product impacts your customer in B2C, all you're selling is essentially happiness and like, you know, in some way, shape or form, but in B2B, there's a little bit more depth that you can go into around how you're impacting process and how much you're saving them or how much you're generating more revenue for them or whatever that you should be picking off a, you know, commensurate level of price. Yeah. And I think if you're, if you are a B2B company, you can add some of that good info in here, especially if you're working, uh, if you're not quite to commercialization yet, but you're doing some field testing and, you know, you can, you can explain some of those things. If you're, uh, product reduces power consumption uh, in the market. You know, maybe it's an industrial product that reduces power consumption, and that's the cost savings that your customer is going to benefit from. You know, show us why you're pricing it, your product the way you're pricing it, and then you know maybe show some of those field tests that you're that you're out doing. Yeah, um, we've proved that we can have X impact. Therefore, we're pricing it as Y. Boom, easy, cool, sounds good. Alternatively, we're pricing it at X because we like X. Yeah, uh. <laughs> yeah you know, some, some solid evidence that, that justifies your pricing strategy. Um, absolutely. And so I just want to make a quick comment. I actually can't see the chat right now, but for those of you that are on the Zoom call, absolutely throw some questions in the, or comments in the chat if you'd like um, to add to the discussion. But yeah, Randall's uh, looking for the due diligence tracker. I think have we sent it out. I don't, it was in an email. I also didn't get that message. Maybe he can do. Uh, this document here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it should have been in the email to all participants. Um, I believe we have it in the drive folder that's basically a resource folder. I think Brandon can probably repost it to the Zoom link here. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the chat. Okay. Another thing that I see you guys have on here, which I think is super impressive when people do it effectively, is basically like the sales pipeline in an organized, neat way where you can see like the funnel, where they're at, um, and then for any, you know, confirmed sales, like accompanying contracts and things like that. So a nice organized list like that is, uh, is also super impressive. Yeah. Show us your sales pipeline. If you have multiple products, show us your sales pipeline by product. Um, you know, I think one of the, one of the other things in 6.4, which I think is, can be super impactful if you do it well. Like if you're a B2C company, you know, if you're a shoe company, you know, tell us who your target demographic looks like, you know, give us a, paint a picture of who your target customer is uh, and then why you're rolling out, you know, the sales strategy, the way you're rolling it out um, and why you're pricing your product, the way you're pricing it out. And so I think that like, if, if you're going through this, this, this list step-by-step, step, um, you know, Tell us who your target customer is and then tell us why you're pricing it that way. If your target customer is like a, you know, 13 to 18 year old, uh, you know, teenager and your pricing strategy is like $500 shoes, that probably doesn't make sense. Um, but, you know, if it's a 30 to 50 year old professional, uh, you know, and, and that's what you're going after, then, you know, explain that in, in this section. And I think it can be super impactful if you give us if you give investors who you're targeting um, and why you're going after them and with what strategy you're, you're yeah, like employing. Tam, Tam Sam Som analysis lands in this category as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I've seen, I've seen a couple of companies in the B2B space do this really well where they're targeting probably something very specific, a specific type of customer. And they, they'll say something like, you know, there's literally 13,000 customers in this space and, you know, here's how we're prioritizing how we're going after these customers. 
um, you know, they've kind of like thought all that through and they've got like the database with all those, who those customers are and, you know, they're working through that. Yeah. 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 The, the best ones that I've seen, the best uh, pitches and diligence rooms that I've seen really articulate this well. I mean, you have to recognize you can't go after uh, your total addressable market uh, like right away. You have to pick and choose, uh, you know, where you spend your time. And this is a really great place to, to be able to, to demonstrate that. It's also helpful to have this strategy around how you're picking through your TAM. Like we're starting with this SOM and then we're going to this one and then we're going to this one because it builds on itself. And we need this product feature in order to get there, but we don't need it in order to get here. And so we can sort of build it over time in order to get there. Um, you know, that all of this sort of, that's a blend of product and sales, but I think that lands in, in this category for sure. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Keep an eye on the time. We probably want to move on to the next section, but before yeah. we do, can you guys just review customer economics for us in a little more detail? Like what is that when you talk about customer economics and what are you trying to understand there? So uh, looking at a few things, so three specific, uh, three letter things. So uh, customer acquisition costs, so CAC, um, so how much it costs for you to acquire a customer. So that would be advertising. It would be your sales staff. It would be, you know, the fact that there's going to be a trial and some of them are going to drop out, um, everything that's going to cost you all the way through until, uh, until they're landed as a customer. Um, and then you have your lifetime value LTV. Uh, so that's how much they're going to pay you for the life of, you know, their contract or how long they, how long you think they're going to be around for, like, say, for example, I don't know, Netflix, let's say that the average life of a customer is five and a half years, um, you know, at whatever, 10 bucks a month, that's however much in revenue for them. And then you have customer servicing cost or CSC. Um, and that's, that's your cost of servicing that customer, whether it's, uh, you know, after sales support, whether it's, you know, whatever stuff goes into servicing that customer. Um, the ratio that's super relevant is lifetime value minus customer servicing cost divided by customer acquisition cost needs to be at least over three. And in an early stage startup, it should be, you know, significantly higher over three. Um, cause it's Where does that magic number three come from in the ratio? Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, that's, that's the general rule, general accepted rule of thumb. Um, but it's so that you have enough room one. You know, you want to be able to be generating enough return on the capital that you're plowing into these customers, especially if the lifetime value is for a long time. Um, if your payback is short, then it can be a little bit of a different conversation. But you need enough you need enough value in these customers to be able to justify paying the overhead um, and, and everything. And the other part is that on historical data, you're getting customers that are by definition easier to acquire than the ones you're getting down the line. And so this number decreases over time. And as you plow more capital into it, that, that ratio will get worse. And so you need a pretty decent level of margin in order to make a business work. And so at this early stage, like well over three would be, would be sure. helpful. Yeah. That's kind of a number that should get you really excited about making a lot of money in this business and should get the investors really excited, right? Yeah, yeah. 100%. And then the <laughs> other, I think to Tim's point, I think you're, if, if you're at this stage now and, and you're, you're at revenue, you know, you, you think about customer acquisition costs as an investment. So you make, you spend a dollar today and you're buying, you know, future revenue. And so you have to make sure that every dollar that you put in to that machine is generating, you know, a, an, a positive outcome. And if it's not, then, you know, investors don't get excited about it and maybe you don't get funded. Um, and then the other thing that I would loop back on is if you have some of that information in here, if your customer acquisition cost is currently like $40, and your model says, your forward looking model says your customer acquisition cost is forecast to be like $3. There's a huge discrepancy. And so like it, you know, just make sure that it's tied in to what your, what your forecast and what your plan says. Um, okay, awesome guys. Um, I think we should move on to agreements and intellectual property. Um, you guys wanna to touch briefly on agreements? Like what are you expecting to see in here? I kind of got a list in. Yeah, it's, I think it's pretty intentionally vague. I, you know, a lot of this lands under the the debt side of things as well. Um, yeah. But if you have a big agreement, like I don't know, so you have a an LOI with, you know, an LOI could land under the above section, but this is sort of a catch all for any sort of agreement that you have that's that's worth mentioning. Well, you know, a product development agreement or something to that effect. Would you expect to see? moving into intellectual property, like an agreement with say a university if you're a spinoff company here or under the intellectual property folder or does it matter? 
Nah, either either or you could you could put it in both, but either way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, you know, if it's if it's a small little agreement for like five thousand dollars, probably doesn't belong in seven point one. If it's a big rent funding agreement like WD, eh, toss it in here. It's probably important. And you probably want to be able to 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 explain that and show that. Um, and I think with this one in particular, uh, one of the really good ways of demonstrate like if you have if you're licensing a whole bunch of product we've seen that tim and i've seen this a few times you dump if you dump 50 license agreements in here it's really really difficult for someone to go through put in the agreements as backup and then summarize them uh and make the summary of the highlight and so that someone could very easily just go in and click and be like yeah i see here you have a license agreement with you know xyz company or you have a number of them and it's really, really easy for someone to see instead of having to plot. And then if they're interested in seeing the underlying information, they can click in behind uh, in the actual uh, folder and, and look at the individual agreements themselves. Um, so th that's one thing that I would do uh, with all the sections, but in this section for sure. Yeah, makes sense. Each section could use a little bit of like a section guide, so to speak, or section okay. summary. Yeah. Okay, guys, let's talk about intellectual property. Um, what, yeah, you have a bit of a list here of like what is included in intellectual property. Um, you guys wanna elaborate on that? What are we talking about when we talk intellectual property? Usually I think patents, but it's actually a lot more than just patents. What does it include? Yeah, uh, anything that would be, uh, you know, sort of not tangible, um, you know, like not, not like a hard asset, but anything that's not, not a hard asset, you know, if you have, uh, if you're a content company, uh, you probably want to have some of that stuff tied up in here. Um, you know, what domain names do you own? Uh, you know, what sort of copyright have you gone down the path of uh, registering? Um, obviously, patents or patent pending would be in this domain. Um, so, yeah, anything sort of anything that sort of uh, would fall under like a non tangible asset. Maybe, you know, aside from the existence of, of the like documents related to, you know, confirming the intellectual property, maybe what's a little bit more interesting is your section item there, 8.2, sort of justifying the IP position. You know, what are you expecting to see if somebody has, say, two or three patents or one patent? You know, what type of documentation are you expecting to see that says, like, you know, either if the patent, especially if it's not granted yet, you know, we expect that uh, we're going to get this patent granted. Like what kind of documentation? I mean, you can, you can get a patent granted and then it can get invalidated afterwards when somebody's like, ah, oh, they probably shouldn't have given that to you. There's definitely prior art. And it's like, oh yeah, you're right. And then they throw it out. Um, so that's what 8.2 is, or yeah, that's what that section is trying that's to get at. Like you pay a lawyer, I don't know, 10, 25 grand to just like root around and find prior art that would invalidate your claim. Um, cause you can write whatever you want into a patent. Um, and as long as it hits the criteria and they'll do, they'll do their own search, but it isn't, you know, wildly in depth because to my point, it's, you know, a mid five figure sum in order to get it done. Um, you know, the, the notion of, of somebody else coming in and, and taking that IP is, uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a risk if you're, if you're entirely an IP company. Yeah. I was just going back to what, what we we're talking. I was just going back to what I've seen this section done well, again, it's, uh, it could be as simple as like a one, two, three page summary where you have just an overview of your intellectual property, what you currently own. Um, so, and, and maybe you can, you can add some flavor around like who you're using to execute on this, like which law firm or who you're using. Um, and then maybe a, a future plan and like why, uh, and like what investments you're making in, in intellectual property, um, both now and and maybe tomorrow or you know six months from now or whatever that might look like. Um, does that make sense, Zach? Yeah, that does make sense. All right, do you guys want to make any final comments on the last couple items here? They they feel sort of like housekeeping items to me, but I'm sure they're very important. Insurance, legal, regulatory. Insurance, have it. Regulatory depends if you're in a regulatory. Uh, environment like if you're in med device or I don't know something where there's like you're doing regulatory stuff um, obviously that one's a pretty important 
section. If you're like a retail business, then a little less. Um, you know, if you're in cannabis, super important. Um, so the section just your mileage will vary, but you know, <laughs> the 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 parts around like if you've been sued, if you've broken the law, like disclose that. Um, both of those things uh, are are pretty important. Um, make sure that you disclose the the skeletons in the closet rather than wasting everybody's time around the table because it'll either it'll either be figured out before the investment is made. And it's better to go in eyes wide open or it'll be figured out afterwards. You don't have to deal with really pissed off investors. Um, so. Okay. And what about the last section there? Data protection. Um, I'm, not, I'm wondering how many startups have actually gotten to the point where they're going to have like a detailed document describing their data protection policy or should they have already done that? Thoughts guys. If they're operating in Europe, it's kind of important because um, they're super you know, uppity about data protection. Again, this one's similar to 10.3. If the answer to regulatory burden is almost nothing, then you probably don't have a lot on the data protection, but if you do, then you do, so. Yeah, like if you're a, if you're a SaaS company that is working with like a bunch of proprietary data, eh, you know, data protection is probably, probably super important. Um, you know, if you're, a, if you're a hardware company that doesn't have, have this type of information, um, you know, probably not. If you're a kid's TV application, for example, obviously privacy and customer data is super sensitive. And so, you know, just having a blurb about what you're doing and how you're complying with all of the relevant like, regulation, uh, I think it's super important. You might get asked, you might get asked the question. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to save some time here at the end for talking about the deal and deal diligence. And I know that in your data room, um, you recommend actually putting that way up at the beginning in the overview. Is that correct? I think this, yeah. Oh, these, I got these sections combined here. I just hit it, hit it, go to E10 and just hit delete and it'll fix itself. Just highlight or, it and or not. delete. No, not, no, not that, just the cell. There you go. Oh, it fixed itself. Kind of. Um, um, well, now it's two 1.0s. Anyways. The point is you have here listed USA to sign, sub doc, term sheet, all that stuff's kind of the basic things you need for a deal. But do we want to talk a little bit about a question that someone just asked me, which is, is there a set set of terms that the investors are looking for? What should I do? I don't know where to start. If it's like a pretty broad question. Um, I mean, if you're raising money, you should have some idea of, of how much you require and um, you know, and, and what you, what you'd like to get out of the deal. You know, I think if you're, if you're very, very early stage, there's probably a couple different ways you can do it. You know, you can, you can take on a convertible note or you can do a safe. Um, if you're not quite ready to set a valuation uh, from an equity perspective. Um, but I think at a minimum, if you're, if you're out raising money and you're in the market to, to do this sort of thing, you should have a, a good understanding of, of what, you know, how much money is required and where you're, where you're going to deploy that and make investments in your company. Um, if you don't, then you're, you might be a little bit early for, for raising. Um, but I think your question, Zach, is more along the lines of, uh, so you, you have a raise open, you, you might have a proposed set of deal terms that you've decided upon. And it's more, you know, what, what would an investor uh, look for or what would an investor want to negotiate on? Is that more or less your question, Zach? Well, I mean, there's kind of like two parts of the question. The first one that was like directly asked to us is like, you know, what are the set, what are your preset terms as an investment group? And maybe just, just want to clarify that we don't do that. You know, I know like you might, some accelerators and some groups like that will basically say apply to our program and we'll invest under these preset terms. We don't do things like that because we're really structured as, you know, an investment negotiation and deal screening process between investors and companies. And so it's, you know, every deal is different. Every deal is negotiated. Um, yeah. So I just want to maybe just set the record straight for everyone in the audience that, uh, you know, there are no preset terms from our group and, you know, every, you know, we're open to all types of terms and conditions based on the unique situation of the company. Um, yeah. There are, you know, I will say there's actually quite a few companies that are still figuring out right now, like over the course of the next few weeks, like how to structure their deal. Um, and that's normal. So it's absolutely normal. Yeah. I think if you, if you don't know how much money you require, I think that that's a problem. 
Um, but I think if you, if you're like, well, you know, I, th I think we need a half a million dollars to, to get to the next level, uh, you know, not necessarily having the term, a term sheet defined just yet is, is, is not, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, that being said, you know, I think there is, there's always, you know, raising money is like anything else. There's always a little bit of a negotiation. Some investors are going to want to see, you know, X and some investors are going to be more comfortable with something else. And, and, and really at the end of the day, I think you're, you're relying on, um, you know, if you find a lead investor that's comfortable setting the terms, then that's a, probably a pretty good way of, of, of approaching it. And then, you know, then hopefully you can get a number of other investors to follow in after that. And I think Tim, Tim will probably have some really good uh, uh, chatter on this as well. Yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, this is a bigger conversation than for a couple of minutes. So I don't know if there's like a specific question, but. Um... Well, I think the general advice I was seeing from Brendan is start with how much money you need and then start, and then work back from that in terms of like what would be an appropriate deal structure. Is that sort of the gist of where you're going, Brendan? Yeah, I think you, I think you want to understand, you know, obviously the capital requirements of the business. Um, but yeah, it is a bit of a, it is a bit of a moving target. And I think you, you also, I mean, part of, you know, the exercise of going through capital raises, preparing all of the documents and preparing all of this stuff, understanding your financial model and where you're going. Um, and then, yeah, recognizing that like, Hey, if you need a million dollars, you know, and that's, that's your raise that the, the deal terms might change two two or three times before you ultimately, everything ultimately gets signed off on because you're probably relying on a number of people to, to help fund a deal of that size. And so, um, you know, it's not a static, it's not a static thing. Um, and then there's lots of little like minor negotiating that happens. So, you know, even if you get a standard set of deal terms, someone might not like the way your ESOP plan is structured. And so you might have to go back and revise something in that. Um, in that scenario, someone might not like the way your employee compensation is done specifically for founders. And you might have to go back and revise some employment agreements. Like there's, there's lots of little nuance, I, but I think if you're working with like really good investors that are, are easy to work with, I think some of those things will just fall out really naturally. Um, the big ones is the big one that you probably end up going to negotiate, end up negotiating is most likely around valuation is probably the the top one and and depending on if you're working with a VC or or institutional money you, you probably will you know some of them have like internal hurdles and they'll look at your model and they'll do a little bit of math to back into like what they expect to to see at for an exit and you know maybe your five million dollar valuation becomes a four million dollar valuation and that's likely that that's likely the biggest place um where movement and then maybe the ESOP would be the, the second thing that I've seen that um, that there's movement on. Um, does that answer your questions? Like, I don't know. I, there's there's so many nuances around raising capital that it's hard yeah. to cover all of them. Every yeah, situation it's, is unique. It's a question yeah. we could talk about for an hour. Well, right. and uh, yeah, so we don't have to talk about that in detail, but I just want to maybe emphasize that in the, uh, I think in the Google Drive folder that Brandon shared earlier, or certainly in the resource document, we actually shared some template documents from NACO that kind of give you the basics and some explainer notes around the three major types of deals, which is an equity deal, a convertible note, and a safe note. So just for everyone's reference, you know, it, it, it is like sort of a lot of information to take in beyond the scope of what we can talk about today. But those are like kind of the three major deal structures that I can think of. Um, and the TNT investors have done deals using all three of those structures in the past. So um, every deal is unique. And sometimes investors just have preferences over what they want to do. And um, so we'll leave it there. Uh, last question coming in, which is where, or I think Tim's maybe answering the chat here. When in the process is the due diligence package is required? Uh, generally for the top five, Tim kind of answered in the chat there. Um, what could be useful is if you have just like that overview document. Um, if you're in the top 20 and you're having conversations with investors, you start off with a, basically a coffee meeting and then things escalate from there. The investors want to learn more about the company. If you have like sort of a summary due diligence overview with that's just like one folder with a high level summary that contains a little bit more information than what you put in the application, like the financials, the deal summary, uh, maybe a little more detail about the business plan. That's kind of a good starting point, uh, just so we don't overwhelm each other. And, you know, you know, we're just kind of moving things. We're doing the appropriate level of due diligence for the stage and the process that we're in. 
I think a really a really good practice, and I think we talked about this like maybe two Tuesdays ago, is to have a light do what we call like a light due diligence room with like your model and your pitch deck and um and and whatnot. You know, just like some some high level documentation that like shows what you're what you're up to. Yeah. Uh, and this is a really good thing to prepare not only for TMT but for just raising investment in general. So have a have a light due diligence room that you can provide to like a vast number of people without having to really vet the investor and then have a more in-depth version of a diligence room like this BDR template that we have um, where you go into more detail on, on specific things in the event that you get asked um, particular questions. Yeah. And, and again, like this, this whole exercise is, is, uh, is a lot for investors, but really it's getting, I think this, the exercise of going through a VDR building out of VDR is really, really, really good for entrepreneurs to understand. Um, so I think, I think hopefully people will learn a lot going through it and looking at all the documentation that's required, uh, making sure you have your ducks in a row before you go out and make, before you go out and ask people for money. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, and actually would help address the question that Larry brings up here in the chat around NDAs. And so if you take Brandon's approach, I think uh, that really helps where you basically have a light due diligence overview and then, um, and then as you build trust between both sides, you can start sharing more detailed information. Okay, these two guys have to run and uh, we're gonna wrap it up for here. Thanks so much, Tim and Brendan for uh, joining us again. Next week, just so everyone knows, Leggy from Future Fields will be joining us. He'll be sharing all his tips and tricks about communicating the story to the investors during the process. And then afterwards, he has a very awesome uh, monthly newsletter that he shares. So looking forward to meeting with him. Okay. Let's call it a wrap here today. Thanks everybody for joining.